Welcome to part two of the Battle Showcase, uh, where I try to explain and demo for you guys how some of the more high action scenarios can be handled in this particular rule set with our particular setting and with stance. Previously, you may recall that the Kavans destroyed Bloody Valentine's beloved, if not a little cheap, Earth car in a parking lot battle, resulting in Halloween Jack and Bloody Valentine swearing revenge on the Kavans. For the purposes of this demonstration, we will be treating this as a refresh. So these two will be getting, uh, well, everyone will be getting their stress markers reduced, removed. Their fate points refreshed. We do not have any conditions. We do not have any stress and we have all of our fate points. Uh, Katie, I'm going to give just two for this. Uh, and the same is true of Akesha and the same is true of Kavan. For Bloody Valentine and Jack, they will be having three fate points. I wanted to go over quickly um, their character sheets to demonstrate what what it is that we're dealing with here so that you guys know kind of what what they're what they can use what they have uh, and how that'll look in the fight and because i've never really used bloody valent i may have used him once for a combat scene but really not that much uh and halloween jack is the same so there may be points when i realize that i have to change something and i will do so accordingly so Let's start off with looking at Halloween uh, Jack and kind of what he's intended to be like. You'll notice, first of all, Halloween Jack has a lot of mental stress box, uh, like a lot of them. It means he's hard to take out mentally or socially. Uh, he is extremely hardy because he is a war criminal, because he's seen so much terrible uh, death and destruction on Earth. And because, as you've noticed, um, when you've interacted with him as characters, likely, he's a little bit crazy, but not in a way that's like keeping him from doing his job. Uh, if we look at his stand, deep down trauma hounds, we see that it summons the user's fears from the shadows. Uh, it manifests physically sort of the fears that Halloween Jack has. Uh, at the same time, it also exposes his psychology by being able to see his fears manifest and him being powered by it, you know, what he's afraid of and what he's thinking. Um, trouble is he's prone to outbursts and various aspects that he has here. Uh, he's a consummate host, so he's, he's always good at hosting. He is a war criminal. He does hate dogs. He is forever alone. And he's, he can be very charming when he wants to be. Those are all really just for um, social things. War veteran or war criminal and heavily scarred war veteran obviously can be used uh, in a fight and so can Walking Terror with a Southern accent. Luckily, you guys have really just run into him, I think, uh, on good terms. I can already tell, looking at his stats, I'm gonna have to probably cut some of these down by one. <laughs> he's, he's a very battle-hardy guy. He's actually meant to be able to, he was built to be able to fight you guys uh, as a group, at least like two or three of you at a time. Um, but you never really, uh, you never really took the bait and fought him. You had no reason to. I understand. He's a very weird and scary guy. If we look at his stunts real quick. We'll see that when he's got his stand active, Halloween Jack can make nightmare rolls as opposed to the usual parameters. Every roll that he uses this, uh, when he uses this, it causes him one shift of mental stress. Um, so what does that mean? It means that he has just basically a plus one by default. It was originally a plus two. His nightmare roll was a plus two, but I mean, cause it'd be a, his nightmare would have been at a six instead of a five, but I feel like that maybe is a little strong. I'll see how that, I'll see how that rolls in this fight. I might have to put it back up to a six. So what happens here is basically every time he uses nightmare instead of his normal parameters, which would be precision, power, speed. That means every time he does that, uh, he takes one mental shift of stress. That's why he has so many stress boxes. Mechanically, he's built to absorb them. Um, and then when he suffered four shifts of mental stress, so if we look at the shift box, that would be if he takes like a, we'll say like a one and a three, or just he, he clicks off the first three boxes or whatever. 
He can unleash his attacks on two targets uh, and at twice the range. I'll probably come up with a different way to handle that mechanic because he was sort of built before we changed how stress works. Uh, it, it was originally you got one, like every box was just one shift instead of what they are now, which is one, two shifts, three shifts, four shifts, five shifts, and six shifts, respectively, for his mental stress. So I'll probably change it around a bit. This was also when range was a bigger deal than it is now um, for when we were doing like zones and stuff. But it basically means that he can attack two targets at the same time with his attacks once he's like taken that much mental stress to kind of uh, reflect the fact that once he's taken enough mental stress and is freaking out enough, his nightmare forms become like faster, long, like bigger, basically uh, shadows of like uh, psychic trauma uh, and then and reflects a uh, big sweeping strikes. Um, Boundless Horror, his uh, stunt says, when he uses true fear past four mental stress shifts. So again, true fear is when he uses nightmare um, instead of a stand parameter roll. Uh, he gains a minor consequence. He puts one on himself called horrified. So when he has horrified on himself, uh, his attacks do both. When he hits you with something and let's just say it does two shifts of damage, it does then both physical and mental stress. Uh, while he does that. So, at this point, his attacks are psychologically as harmful as they are physically harmful. They're psychically harmful. And that is more a reflection of he's giving into this, like, great well of uh, psychic fear and terror and trauma inside of his head. Um, his attacks, like, just have that, that touch of terror to them. And then, once per session, and this is probably, I, I may even use this today, um, he can cause a breakdown of all social order within a scene. So all targets with a lower gravity level than his succumb to this effect. All targets with a higher gravity are immune and may attempt to reinstate order with an appropriate role against a passive difficulty of four. So what does this mean is that if Jack is in the middle of a crowd, let's just say he's in the middle of a crowd and there's like an ELO officer there and he wants to cause havoc, he absolutely can do that. Um, the way that this usually manifests is he shouts something or can throw, he, he'll be like the first one to throw a brick or uh, set something on fire. But his particular brand of starting chaos, like is very effective and it causes people to just freak out and create like a big stampeding mob. Um, you can tell in certain scenes and fight scenes, this can be a very effective tactic. In social uh, combat, this can also be extremely effective. It doesn't necessarily have to be that they become, like they turn into a human riot. He could turn like a whole crowd of people against like one person. And the way that this is reflected in the mechanics is usually gonna be that there's a, uh, he gets free invokes as the crowd kind of does the work for him, uh, whatever it is that he's trying to accomplish. So for someone that's like a guerrilla fighter that's meant to go in and kind of overthrow entire nations or, you know, just kind of do help a coup or something like that. That is what this is. This is what Jack does. He's like a very specialized in fear, um, anarchy, you know, and looking like he's the good guy or the guy with manners while he does all this. Like he is. It's, it's kind of like his thing. So. Uh, Marisol asked, so he'd really jack up the ranch if he ever visited. I feel like, I feel like they would be immune or otherwise, um, <laughs> they're already under the effects of a similar thing. So I don't think it would actually change anything for them. They're already like in a constant state of rebellion against father. Um, if anything, to be impudent, uh, they may actually pretend that they are not rebelling and treat Lewis well until Jack leaves and then they go back to beating up Lewis. You can't tell them what to do. <laughs> so with all that in mind, when we look at Jack's uh, sheet again real quick in the mental stress boxes, we can see that when he uses Nightmare a lot, he's going to max himself out on mental stress. And he is going to definitely, in a fight, a prolonged fight, if he wanted to burn himself out, he could absolutely turn himself into a gibbering mess of uh, mental consequences. Like he goes over the line on from using the Nightmare rolls and um, being full on consequences and being full on mental stress. He can absolutely take himself out of a fight. It's probably a mechanic that I need to work on a little, like give him a way to at least shed some mental stress. But on the other hand, maybe that's just the cost of like, he gets very powerful when he's got that mild consequence and he's got his stress shift like 
amount above four. Like in a fight against multiple opponents, like he can he can do a lot of damage. Um, take some people out very quickly. It depends. And he's not taking physical stress while he's doing this anyway. So I guess we'll find out during the uh, during the fight itself. Um, so let's look at now that we're done looking at Halloween Jack and we have sort of an idea of Halloween Jack stand. Let's take a look at Bloody Valentine. Bloody Valentine is the president of the Seven Nation Army. He's basically the president of Earth as far as like the largest military power is concerned. He has a stand called Last Caress. Um, Last Caress strips reactive forces, uh, reaction forces from objects himself and others, allowing him to bypass inertia, gravity, and many other influences, probably including friction, I'm sure. Um, what this does is basically if you touch something, he can touch something and then it doesn't have gravity acting on it or it doesn't have inertia acting on it or anything like that. Um, that means he can fly himself around and maybe touch a wall without crashing and killing himself. Means he can also like throw objects and just have them fly in a straight line. Um, he's just fucking around with those forces basically. As long as he can, he, basically it's, it's on touch. So that's the limitation. Um, and his stand itself doesn't really do a whole lot of fighting. He's the one who does most of the fighting, which puts him in more physical danger. He's also extremely, extremely hardy. I may uh, reduce his physical stress boxes. Um, he's got five, which is the same as a star man. I feel like that's, I know he's the president, but fuck. Uh, let's take that down to four right now and see how that works out. Um, I mean, one of the reasons why he would be more physically resilient is he is a user of spin. Uh, looking at some of his stats, he also needs to have some things reduced. Uh, yeah, let's just take those things down a little. He had a, he had a stat at a seven. So a lot of these were made. A lot of these character sheets were kind of like made at a time when like the numbers were really inflated, and those numbers have like since come down. I've been working on it, and making sure that things are a little bit more balanced. Um, but there will still be characters that have stats at six and seven. Some of that is like, uh, maybe I can live with it. Some of it, it's going to be a little bit much like to have to have to actually balance out. Because really, when you think about a six or a seven, those numbers are, are big, obviously. But what those really are is like free stunts, you know, or like generally like way too applicable stunts that are like, you know, on every situation. And that's kind of busted at times. But when you're fighting a monster like Avicii, it's kind of it makes sense in a lot of ways because he's big and... You know, it's a matter of scale. Um, for Bloody Valentine, I think it's probably better to cut his uh, stats down so that five is the highest instead of seven. Just something I did right now when I was looking at it. Um, looking at his aspects real quick, also, uh, you'll notice that he has, he's insecure about his height. That is his trouble. Um, he's extremely strange. He's randomly violent and randomly reasonable. He's obsessed with obedience and he is a devout believer in the Seven Nations. So he's a very strange man who uh, doesn't want to be called short and um, can randomly just, you know, start a fight or end a fight, um, much to the dismay of his opponents. If we look at his uh, stunts, first of all, he's a spin user. So his spin object of choice is a giant metal wheel, like a shock room. Um, it's huge. Uh, if anyone wonders why I gave him a giant metal shock room, it's because it represents the world. It's just a giant circle that he uses to absolutely bludgeon people to death um, and cut through them. Uh, yes, his spin is only at two, uh, Marisol points out. Yes, it is. Um, he relies more on his stand than on spin. Uh, his stand kind of is spin. Yes, Simone is a higher stand, a spin user. But Bloody Valentine's not like a... Um... The thing about... Um... I guess real quick to go into it, the thing about the martial arts in this setting and game in general, and you'll notice this when you read the PDF, is like, I'm pretty sure Johnny Joestar only has either a one or a two in spin. And he is hands down the most powerful spin user in the in part seven, I believe. Um, He's not the most skilled or experienced at it, but when he uses spin in combination with the stand, he gets a very unique understanding of how spin works. So your stat number doesn't reflect at all what the potential devastation is that you can cause with spin. It's more just the reference of like how often you lean on spin to do things. 
and kind of what your character's approach is to different different situations. Like, um, Giro Sabelli has a higher spin rating than Johnny, but Johnny has like what is basically like an unbeatable spin power. So you gotta take that sort of thing with a, with a grain of salt um, when it comes to looking at stat numbers. And it's also a matter of balance that uh, he doesn't have spin at like, you know, four or five or something like that. It's a little ridiculous. Okay, so let's look at uh, his stunts real quick. If we look at Bloody Valentine's first stunt around the world, uh, we will immediately see that he has a stunt that is meant to Dynasty Warriors the shit out of people. Uh, he has a stunt that can hit, just do the math here. Okay, so we'll just read it. Uh, when he uses his war wheel to spin through as many targets as he can, rolling a spin. So he's he's rolling spin to do this. And when he's taking on... Well, I wrote this a little weird. We'll read it out loud. Bloody Valentine uses his war wheel to spin through as many targets as he can, roll, in a spin result in one round. So when he rolls spin, three. That means he can target three opponents at the same time in one round with a spin attack pretty strong uh if he were to roll and it's just the roll it's not not any invokes because otherwise he'd be able to just boost this to kill everybody yeah you, you want a team of like nine people i guess so when the number is above 10 yeah yeah i'm gonna have to probably change this uh it's not it wouldn't be i don't want it to be multiplied by 10 because that's ridiculous but that's how that would work so you can see then if he was fighting more than 10 people yeah, you know what? I may, I, I don't know. I might change it to five or six or something, but um, and then change the next one to ten. So if he's fighting, it, yeah, you know what? Let's change it real quick. Why not? Um, this is, I guess, a good insight on how I do stunts, um, or how I kind of adjust them. So when he's fighting ten or more people, we'll say the numbers multiplied by five, and when he's fighting a hundred or more people, that number is multiplied by ten. And I think that works out better. It makes more sense, and it's it's not as ridiculous because he could potentially just kill, like, 100 people in one hit, which is not the craziest thing, I guess, for a dude like this, but it's still, like, you know, this, this cuts it down a little. One round, really, killing 100 people with your ring, you're not God. Um, so with that in mind, if we look at his roll, we'll do a spin roll again, um, and we can see that, okay, he doesn't hit, he doesn't, he doesn't fucking hit anybody with that. He hits one person, basically, that's yeah, a big whiff. The one person catches his ring and then smirks. Uh, we'll say five. Okay, so if he's fighting on like nine or so, one to nine people, then he can hit five targets with that roll. If he's fighting 10 to 19, or no, 10 to 99 people, then uh, his, that, that ring is going to hit 25 of them which is a pretty substantial number. You're talking about he's hitting one-fourth of a group that uh, in one hit, one round, he's doing this, um, hitting them all with that, and a five is going to hurt, and he can invoke on that to cause more damage. It's just that the number of targets he hits is capped. So he can just invoke on this and absolutely just take out um, 25 people in one hit and still be ready to like defend himself against like the rest. Um, and then if it's 100 or more than we're talking that he can, you know, you can hit up to 50 people at the same time. So the number just kind of increases by that sort of uh, factor there. And yes, that is meant to be so that he can like kind of wade into a military formation, just well, not wade, fly above them and just start uh, throwing his ring around to fuck people up. His next stunt, I want your skull. Uh, this is more, this is kind of like a social role, but it can still, yeah, yeah, no, it's mostly social. Uh, this is meant to be isolate and kind of like antagonize the target. If he succeeds against a single target with his regal role, then um, they will have the consequence hated by Bloody Valentine, which will give all Seven Nation Army forces a plus two invoke against them. Now, this is a very strong consequence for a variety of reasons. And this is something you'd want to pump if you were maybe in. A mass combat situation, you wanted to kill one particular target. Now, in this, and this was also meant to be used kind of socially, but looking at the way I worded it, it's obviously meant to be used uh, in physical combat as well. So, Bloody Valentine picks out a target, and the Seven Nation Army forces, whoever they are, will work 
double extra hard to kill that person, whoever it is. Like that is that is what he does. He paints a target on you and any other Seven Nation Army forces who are fighting you have a free plus two. You are in big fucking trouble if this happens. How do you get rid of this consequence? Uh, probably has to be done out of combat. And you probably have to either socially negotiate with Bloody Valentine or change your identity. Because otherwise, he's going to have people just hunting you forever. And the stunt reflects that. His gravity feat is extremely dangerous. And the reason for that is he has to roll his reverie, probably against a passive difficulty of a three or four. Depending, It depends actually on how chaotic a scene is. It's a sliding difficulty scale. So once per scene, he can roll that, um, depending on how chaotic it is, and add the scene aspect bloody chaos. So while this is active, this bloody chaos scene aspect is active, all shifts caused by all forces are doubled. This is basically, now things are going to become a violent bloodbath for both sides. And because he has the ability to hit multiple targets at once, this works in his favor for the most part. Like, while there are more people to act against him, in a mass combat situation, we have to consolidate those forces. So, for example, if Bloody Valentine is fighting, like, a unit of, like, a thousand soldiers, they're going to have, and it's just him, if we're doing this to scale, they're going to have some very, very significant bonuses, and they're going to have, like, a lot of different things that they can do, whereas he can only usually take one action or deal with one thing. But they also have to all funnel in towards him to, to kill him, um, if that's what their goal is. So, like, to scale... Something like this can mean that he may take out a significant portion of their forces. The roles wouldn't be one for one. Remember that fate is not 5e in that when we do roles in combat roles, we don't always need to determine what happens within a six second round. We can determine what happens over a series of actions or an extended period of time. We can compact that down into a summary as we try to negotiate and work around how this fits into the narrative. So as an example of this, let's see, pretend that Bloody Valentine is fighting like an army forces, the army of like a thousand guys. So they make the first role to try to target and control him. We'll give them a plus seven for this. So it's a pretty significant uh, bonus. He then has to roll... Um, Let's see, uh, we'll, we'll say with spin against them if he wants to take out a significant portion. So he's got a four. He's going to invoke twice. Um, no, he's going to invoke three times. And so because of that, he's going to do six, uh, with Bloody Chaos active, six shifts of damage against them and probably cut down their for fighting forces as um, he is able to hit uh, 40 soldiers at once. We'll say he just like devastates the shit out of them and it causes all sorts of problems in their formations. I guess an army of a thousand, 40 people, not that big a deal, I guess, but depending on where they are, what happens, I mean, losing a chunk like that is pretty significant. The army probably likely has big a big sh physical shift. I know you guys maybe remember from the Avicii fight, the way that we were handling uh, combat and scale means that usually when we have like a unit uh, formation type of thing. They have a lot of physical shifts, sometimes as many as 10. We can go to, for example, uh, if Marisol wants to open... Oh, there they are. You're right under circles. Yeah, you'll see that they have an injuries um, injuries box. Not necessarily meant to uh, say that those are casualties, of course, because, you know, we don't always have to say that a million people are killed. Like, Bloody Valentine doesn't have to kill like 40, 50 people or whatever with his attack. He can, I guess, but, um, you know, these are injuries. So, and, and the way that we're handling this specifically is that that also means that like, although Bloody Valentine only can only like take out or target 50, we'll say that he can only target, take out 50, but he can probably injure enough of them on the side or just because of the, the collapse of a formation that it actually causes more injuries uh, to the force. The point of the stunt really past uh what it does to like the single like like up to nine people the point is really just to show that in a scene he can fight that many people like hit that many people with a ring it just bounces off them um but once you get past 10 100 etc those are really getting into like scaling issues 
So um, I, may, I may change kind of like some of how that works to be more reflective of how we approach scaling combat. Uh, but for right now, you can just assume that him against that army with that role means that he probably he, he did a devastating amount of damage to them. Uh, he if, if we're if we're taking the circles the uh stress that we the new stress system that we have i mean he's already clicked off their six box that's pretty big they only have 10 so it, it would be a long drawn out engagement how would that be reflected in the actual narration is that we would then go through like a variety of different like like bloody valentine appears on the field somebody spots him first thing he does is bounces his ring off of the first guy and then it just starts to bounce down the line as it like begins to collapse this like chain of scouts that are all trying to radio in that the previous guy isn't responding or they hear something whistling in the woods or whatever the fuck. And by the time he's done, he has like taken out a chain of like 40 different soldiers before they even know that he's there. Uh, but then of course the last guy collapses in front of like his commanding officer. And then he's able to call it in because the rings lost enough momentum and that's when the engagement begins against Bloody Valentine. They know that he's there. People are freaking out. They're, these guys are just normal army guys. Bloody Valentine is the president of the earth, and he apparently is drunk. He's had too many beers, uh, and now he's, he's going to beat you up. Uh, that's generally how Bloody Valentine works. So now that we know, this has been the longest of long rundowns about these two stand users, but one of the reasons is that I'm going through the lengths to explain this is that they were made before we made certain changes. And so I had to go through some of their stunts and their approaches to uh, kind of fix them. Another reason is uh, they've never really been used in like combat combat in this game, in this campaign. And there's going to be a lot of characters that are just going to be like that. I come up with an idea. They never get used really uh, in a combat because you guys are very anti, uh, you know, you're not murder hobos. You want to, not get into a fight with the death, a fight to the death with uh, the president of the United States or his uh, diamond masked uh, war criminal best friend. That's fine. I understand that. Th those are those. That's scary. Those are scary times. If this was um, like a more traditional tabletop RPG, uh, these two would be like the king and his fucking most trusted death knight or something. So you don't want to fight those guys most of the time. You don't. You don't want to do it. Um, I understand, but I also I did give him a stat block. I'm going to use it today. There we go. With this combat scenario set up, we have something that's going to we're going to we're going to be testing a few things. We're going to be testing scaling up in a fight and continuing to do so. We're also going to be testing some of the big mass combat coordination and uh, defense, offense, kind of and maneuvering. We're going to assume for the purposes of this demonstration that Kev, Katie, and Alkesha are more like players. They're more like the players who are trying to... They're, they're, the, they're the protagonist here. So we're looking at things narratively from their perspective, uh, mostly because I think most of the audience, whoever watches this, likes the moon and doesn't want it to be destroyed. I would think. Maybe you do. Maybe after all the things we've done in the game, you've decided these people are simply too silly to live. I understand that. But I'm going to default choose that they're the heroes. It's just a matter of narrative and kind of like what we're going for in the fight. What this means is there's going to be a little leeway. There's going to be a little more narrative uh, weight given to some of the things that they do. And there's going to be a few more opportunities for them to kind of like win the day or come up with some kind of bullshit shown in anime um, solution to a problem. The reason I do that is because if we were watching this as a show, then we would know that uh, if Bloody Valentine just steps on Katie's head and then like, you know, cuts everyone else's head off with his like ring and then walks away and goes home and eats a donut. I, it's going to be hard to continue that story. It's kind of done, right? I mean, he just killed everybody. So we have to have a little bit of plot armor, a little bit of, uh, you know, sometimes deus ex machina, though you obviously want to avoid both of those things when you can. Um, unfortunately, in kind of any kind of narrative thing, I think characters that are meant to be the perspective characters like kind of have those by default. And if they don't, unless you're a really good writer, 
uh, you get into a situation where you don't have a narr- <laughs> you don't have a narrator or perspective character anymore. The only example I can think of off the top of my head is uh, Game of Thrones, where characters can just die, but there's also like a billion fucking you know points of view in the in the Game of Thrones book, so it's not as big a deal. 